I've been with um, Bids from um, straight out of university. Um, I want to tell you about our experience of creating a bid in Camden Town, London, and um, where that bid started, because that bid also started, BID started in the early days when legislation in the UK changed, and then our town city um, decided, actually, this is a very interesting model. Can we use this in Camden Town as a tourist attraction and in the business community there? So as, spoken, uh, as mentioned before, a BID has to draw a map where the BID is going to be. Um, once you've drawn the map, every business in that area is then has to pay a levy towards the BID effectively. Um, it sounds controversial at first, but when you know that everyone has to vote by a majority of over 50%, and our businesses, we have about 300 businesses, we've had three successful votes so far. Um, I think la the election before last, we had one of the highest yes votes in the country. Um, over 86% of businesses voted, and then of the 86% of businesses, almost 90% voted yes. So even if everyone else voted no, including the ones that voted no, we would still have over 60 or 70% majority. And that means what we're doing is successful. Businesses love what we're doing. Um, end of the day, if the businesses don't like what we're doing, they vote no. If they vote no, I'm not here basically to say hello to all of you <laughs> and do our jobs. So um, it's a very direct relationship. Our businesses tell us when we're doing a good job, very quickly and they also tell us when we're doing a bad job very quickly as well. It's not disconnected a bit like um, Hashala Puli, um, politics in that sense. With um, the government and council, everyone can blame each other, they can point fingers. But with the BID, your businesses say, they can see you every single day basically and some of them always call me saying, Hasanul. <laughs> But um, this is our area in Camden Town. We raise about £800,000 a year in levy. So just to give you, but over the years, this has increased. Before our levy was only 350,000. So over the years, as the area became more successful, um, raised more and more levy. We have a lot of voluntary members as well in our BID. So as mentioned before, um, because Camden Town was so successful, other areas like Kentish Town, um, which also will probably become a BID, but Euston was saying, well, we want to join the club. You're doing all this amazing work in Camden Town, but we want to be part of Camden Town as well, BID. And because it's so far away, well, it's, it's a neighbor, but just like Waterloo, it's a transport hub, we realized it needs its own identity. And we said, okay, then if the businesses are saying, please, 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 can we join the club? We say, okay, then let's see if there can be a separate BID there, and if the city um, will accept it and the businesses are saying yes, they would like it by majority, then we'll go there as well. Again, it was really successful. It's been operation for four years. It's the sister bid to Camden Town Unlimited. So same management team, but two, running two bids, BIDs now. So the bids were originally created by the town center management team. So the town center management team felt as though they didn't have enough resource to deliver the vision that they had. They had limited resources. Some people were paying, some people weren't. The council was making a contribution, but obviously government has less and less and less money. So they thought, okay, the bid model is gonna be a good model to basically maximize value for their businesses as long as the businesses want it. So I'm gonna take you through the journey, um, what we call um, bid level one, level two, level three, but you can do all the things at the same time. What bids internationally, or at least in the UK, in the beginning start to do is, okay, you've just started as a BID, and you say, uh, your businesses say, what are you doing for me? So what most BIDs do is make easy wins, very, very simple, easy fixes. For example, um, security, cleaning, and all of these things have to be on top of the city resources. So any services the city have is here, then your, your money and contribution has to pay for more services. So you're not replacing services, you're adding services, because this is new money, meaning new services. So you're always adding. As soon as you try to replace, then that becomes an issue. So that's why we always say it's additionality. We have to always 
prove a return on investment. Every single time we spend a pound, we have to always say, okay, how far did we make the pound go, basically? So in the beginning, it's easy things like joint procurement. We say, okay, we have 300 businesses in the area. We go to a gas provider, electricity provider, and say, okay, if you're one business, you get this much savings with the gas or electricity, for example. But if you're 300 businesses, then all of a sudden you get a bigger discount. So those are the sorts of easy things you can do. Again, cleaning, for example, recycling, other sorts of services where if you go as a uh, business commerce effectively or a BID and you can go to all of these providers and say, okay, all of you can bid to provide our area with these services as a preferential um, service provider and you'll get the contract for this region, then everyone saves money. And those are easy things you can do in the first one or two years. Everyone says, okay, we'll all use the same rubbish collector, for example, or we all use the same security, or you all use the same service. It can be anything, really, but you do it together and you save money effectively. So that's the bit of one point also source things. You spend the money you have in your pocket. So you've taken it from the businesses and now you're spending it. So it's a very easy transaction, but you're proving value from the beginning. Bid 2.0 gets a bit more interesting. So remember, the bid is just a vehicle. It's just a tool, effectively, like a paintbrush. You have the canvas, you've got the paintbrush. It's up to the team to create a vision. They have to have the vision of what they want to execute. Without the vision, the bid will always just do very basic things. So, which is fine, that's okay as well, that's fine. A lot of bids will only do this, and that's okay as well. If the, bid, the businesses are happy and they say this is all we want, that's great. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. But then, for ourselves and other bids, you start to go on this journey where you think, okay, what else can we do? How can we evolve? We don't want to just do the same things and just say, okay, this is all we're going to do. So what bids have started doing and what we have done is um, lobbying to represent the businesses in our area and say, okay, these are the concerns and the issues that are is is on our high street, is in our community effectively, and saying, okay, the, our businesses come to us and say, okay, what are you doing about it? How are you talking to the city hall? How are you talking to regional government? How are you talking to national government? Um, so these are the sorts of organizations we work with. We work with the mayor of London, um, transport organizations, so government transport, European projects, so we've done several European projects across cities in mean, partnership, and that's the very important thing, public-private sector partnership. This a BID model gives you an excuse to work with the local government. And where this becomes even more important is match funding. So if you as the BID, where in London um, it's become very common, or in the UK and the States it's become common, is you say, okay, we'll make a contribution to a project, but then the government has to match it, for example, or give a contribution as well to that project. So that way government gets to say, oh, we've got money from business, and the businesses can turn around and say, well, we got money from government, so it's a win-win sort of a thing. Everyone says they got money from someone else, basically, but you're making your money go further. So this is like a graph where it shows you all the different bids in London. The second one, green bar, is basically um, how much bid levy is raised, and then the blue bar is how much money is invested into the area by the bid. The second one is Camden Town Unlimited. So you can see, in comparison to the levy we generate, how much investment we bring into the area is so much higher. Um, then. Over time, what we found is uh, how we del deliver projects has been innovating as well. And um, originally, this is how we would do it. You'd have your money, and then you spend it. That's it. Very simple. It's easy. Whatever you want to do. Then we started thinking, OK, what's different with the BID and government is you've got the government who's like a giant ship. When it wants to turn, it turns very slowly. It's just like. It's like, it's moving, but you, 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 you're going to get old and you're going to have grandchildren by the time it makes a decision, basically. Whereas a BID is like a speedboat. And it can take risks. It can go places very quickly. We can, we can make decisions like that. We change our mind like that. Um, we have our accountability with our businesses. As long as the bid has the support of, of its businesses, you can say, okay, government's too busy doing politics, doing Brexit, doing whatever it's doing, basically. Let them do that, but we still need to make money. We still need to look after our communities. And as the BID, we then basically say, OK, what do you want us to do? And it's a conversation, really. The bid team will say, OK, these are our ideas. You don't have time to find these ideas, to find these solutions. But we, the bid team, have the time. That's what you pay us for. We will go internationally and say, OK, what's the best solution to X problem? What's the best solution to Y problem? How can we implement it? And then we effectively 
effectively become like an innovation center where we say, we'll try the different issues without too much um, problem. So if it works, we do it. If it doesn't work, we don't do it. Now I want to show you some examples of how that worked in Camden Town in real life. So the first one is collective. In 2009, this is basically proving the value of the bid. In 2009, we had the credit crunch. The whole market collapsed internationally. Um, a lot of shops on Camden Town High Street were completely closed. Um, more and more shops were closing. Businesses were leaving the area. You think, OK, why would businesses pay for us to then create competition for them? And this is about 10, 11 years ago. So you have to remember, now it's very fashionable. Empty space, do something with it. 10, 11 years ago, empty space, why should I pay for my neighbor? You can, you can imagine paying their own levy was hard enough, but the, convincing them to pay for the empty neighbor so that they can have a successful business there was even harder. But the benefit, we, we explained to them, commerce is where everything starts from. Um, without the businesses there, your area is either going up or it's going down. So we were saying if we, either we attract businesses to the area or people just want to leave, basically. So we told them, let us take the leases of these premises. We talked to the landlord and said, look, give us the premises. We'll become like your, um, how should we put it, uh, agent. And we'll basically find occupiers. And we were taking one, two shops on the high street and putting businesses that were interesting, beneficial to the community into the area and then giving it to them permanently. So we're effectively like, agents for them. Uh, one thing we found out was all these um, retail space on the ground floor had spaces above them. And we thought, OK, it's empty space. What can you do with it? So we basically created workspace for young people. And remember, this is 10 years ago. So workspace, office space wasn't a real thing. Co-working space. We accidentally started doing this. And you have to remember, none of this was a plan. We didn't have, we had a vision, okay, make the area better, but how you make it better, we didn't really know. So you have to remember, I don't have a background necessarily when we started in all of this sort of stuff. It's trial and error. You think, okay, you have this problem, you try this solution, then you f figure things out. You change patterns, you, you trial and error. Keep on trying, sometimes you fail, sometimes you win. We tried um, workspace, that was an amazing success. Uh, we had academies, that was an amazing success. Then what we did was we got, we were doing so well that the council turned around to us and said, we want to give you funding. The government said, we want to give you funding because you're creating lots of jobs, you're creating lots of business. So then we made it even bigger. We took on a massive space like this and the market was 24 seven. So you could have the, um, a market store like that on the right hand side and you could have it for one or two days, then someone else has it for another two days. Someone has it in the morning, someone has it in the evening. So the market was never the same, the same day in the morning to the afternoon, or on a Monday or a Tuesday, or the same on a weekend. So a student could have it on the weekends. Someone could have it Monday to Friday, for example, these market stores within this market. So the market was always changing, it was buzzing. So you never really knew. You could always go in there and discover something different. And again, we just did that by accident because we thought, okay, how could we maximize the space? How could we basically get maximum number of businesses, the opportunity to try to sell on the high street, basically. And all of these people were trying new retail opportunities. They didn't know if it's going to work in real life, but we gave them the chance to see if it'd be successful. Then from that, we would give them a uh, business space on the high street through our pop-up shops. So they can try it here, then they go into the pop-up shops. These are some of the economic numbers that we generated. For every one pound we put in, we got 12 pounds out. Um, created hundreds of jobs. In each one of these spaces, we create loads of jobs, creating loads of businesses. We created quite a few multi-millionaires, actually, like teenage, very little baby millionaires, but it's one of those things. I keep on thinking, when's it my turn? But I never get rich from these. But um, <laughs> it's, it's really good, though. We're, we're creating success stories. So the government did, um, does reports on us all the time to say, okay, why is Camden Town bid so successful? Um, and what we found was we had a very flexible approach, just like startup businesses. When you think of startup businesses, they are always looking for opportunity. They don't say, okay, we will embarrass ourselves because we've told the world we're going to do this, and if we fail, we still do it because it's going to be embarrassing. If we fail, you fail. If a product's not selling, you take it off your shelf. You don't. 
You don't keep on trying to sell it just because you told people you're going to sell it. You just take it off your shelf. Every single service that didn't work, we stopped doing it. Every service that worked, we did more. We invested more into it. So it's, it's having that flexibility. And I think through flexibility and curiosity and trying, innovation happens. Because, and we're just copycats. So we basically look at what people do. And then it's like Apple, for example. Apple didn't really invent everything that they produced. They just did it better and made it cooler. And that's what really innovation is. You just look at what people are doing and then just copy them, really. That's what we've done, and we've done it really well. Uh, this, again, was a hospital um, that was five floors. I'll go a bit faster because I'm just thinking about time. Um, what we realized was government funding was going away, and at this point, it was always a charity. So the bid started this organization, which was called Collective, and Collective became so big that it became bigger than the BID. The, cha um, the charity now has, it makes almost six, seven hundred thousand pounds a year. It's like a million pounds in the bank account just sitting there. So the organizations that you can create from BIDs can become their own success stories. Now the charity itself creates all these spaces on its own, self-funded. The BID doesn't give money anymore. And the idea is it now charges one third of market rate. Wherever it finds spaces and opportunities, it will basically create workspace, retail opportunities, and those sorts of things. But again, we weren't like a precious parent. We basically have these sort of projects, and we let the projects succeed, and let them have their own teams, and grow and go on and do their own things. If we kept on trying to hold on to it and basically get all the credit for it, it would suffocate. It would basically have, it won't have the chance to grow. If, if a project becomes successful, you have to just let it go and you have to let it have its own teams, which is very hard because they sometimes do more cooler things than the BID do. And it was your project originally, but it's one of those things. So this is where we are now. The future plan for the um, charity is it's going to start buying properties. There's an opportunity there, basically, because we found we, um, these sorts of spaces are now disappearing, which is a good thing. But at the same time, where will the new retailers be for the next generation? Where will the opportunities for local people to try business be? Um, because everything's becoming unaffordable or those spaces are becoming less and less, basically. Because we still want to give our local people, young people, older people, a chance to try commerce, a chance to basically become the next um, Facebook or the next um, retailer like Zara or whoever it might be. And without these sorts of spaces where they can collaborate, where they can talk to each other, those sorts of things might not happen. Let's skip through these ones. An interesting thing that we found is a lot of developers now found the work that we're doing so useful for attracting business that they give us space when they make a building. So before they even build the building, they're like, okay, we want to give you some free space. And uh, that's right free space up to 10,000 square feet sometimes, where they basically say, OK, you can have it rent free, space free. All we want you to do is bring your community, fill it up with businesses, fill it up with young people, and those sorts of things. And this is the, remember, this is the BID doing this. Um, Rewind five, six years ago, we never would have thought we'd be basically being given free space now. When buildings are being built, they'd want to put us in those buildings. So it's an interesting shift. And again, Sometimes you can't plan for these things. You have to let it sort of evolve over time. Now, we've done it again, hopefully. This is another organization that we've created called the Camden Highline. It's starting off as a project. Um, it will be like the New York Highline, hopefully, connecting King's Cross to Camden Town. And the idea is there's a disused part of the railway. Again, it was just an idea. Someone emailed us. And that's the irony. Someone actually emailed us an article saying, oh, did you know there's a bridge here that's empty? Wouldn't it be a good idea to have a high line? So then I just took that little picture of the railway, drew a line on the map, and I said, OK, maybe this could become a high line. Now we've invested money. We then raised funding on crowdfunding, created a business plan. We have everything pretty much in place now, permissions. We're working with the developers on both sides. But again, that started off with an email. And I always say, um, that guy, there was a random guy who just said, oh, you guys do cool things. Did you know there's a chance here for you to do something else different, completely different to what, anything we've done? We've never done parks. We've never done, this would require millions of pounds worth of funding. We don't have that money. We're not that rich. But money is not the problem. Uh, when you have a great idea, money comes to ideas. That's what we found. Um, for example, in this situation, over 300 people donated 62,000 pounds. 
And can you imagine, these are local people, some people donating two pounds, some people donating a hundred pounds, and even now, people are still donating money to this project. So the business case has been created, the feasibility meaning the engineer's report has, that's what paid for the engineer's report, the crowdfunding. It proves it can be done, it is going to be done. We have, now have promises from both developers from King's Cross and Camden Town, the billion pound developers. We showed them the value of their property going up, and that's now that's unlocking the opportunity for us to do this. They're saying three, four hundred thousand pounds on one side and four, five hundred thousand on the other. But again, we believe from the beginning and I saw one email, drew a line on a map, sent it to our board, presented it to them and said, ooh, maybe we could do this. Let's see what can happen. And now we're almost halfway there. Once it's built, everyone's going to look back and say, oh, it was obvious. It made sense. <laughs> but right now, people still think it's a bit crazy. When we ask the council for money, beginning this journey about one year ago, they said, oh, you're crazy. This is never going to happen. But now, 12 months later, they, the council, the city, is about to give us three or 400,000 pound contribution. And that's what happened with us before, with the other collective, with all our pop-up shops. They didn't believe in it. They said, oh, what is this? They didn't understand it. Fine, we do it on our own. We go take some risk. We'll take our BID money and we'll trial it. If it's successful, then people come on board. But that's what the bid can do. And again, it's a tool. It can do these things, but it requires that vision to be able to do it. It requires the team to be able to pull it together and requires those partnerships. Because the business community can't do it on its own. The council can't do it on its own. Central government is busy. They, can't, they can contribute if you make enough noise. You have to say, look, this is such a great idea. You have to sell that idea to them. This is the high line. That's where it's going to be, hopefully. You can see it's empty on that side. But it's going to be nice, I think. It's going to be really nice. Yeah. So now we're working on the next iteration of bids, hopefully. So we've just created something called Alternative Camden, which is an innovation district. It's, uh, we call it Alternative Camden because we feel as though everyone's trying to do innovation district, but what is innovation really? Um, from our point of view, innovation districts have always been either government-based or one really large company like Google or someone like that trying to do things. Uh, from our point of view, bids are actually in a better place because on our board we have residents, we have police, we have businesses, we have the city, we have all of these elements of the community because the way we see is when one part of the community is affected, whether that's crime, whether that's cleaning, whether that's job or employment, everyone's affected. Business is affected, um, residents are affected. So if you have homeless people on the street, everyone's affected. It affects business, affects Residence affects everyone. If there's crime, everyone has the same issues and everyone wants to work together. And it looks good when the city, because we have three or four councillors. We have the leader of the council, which is the city that sits on our board. We have um, um, the resident associations that sit on our board. The sergeant, which is like the senior police sitting on our board. We have everyone on our board and everyone sits together and discusses these sorts of issues. So with the alternative Camden Innovation District, we're hoping to look at the sort of things that Government's busy, basically focused on the grander scheme, Brexit, unfortunately. I think it's crazy. I don't know why. It's one of those things. But um, we are going to focus on the real issues that our businesses are saying, can we do more? And we think we can do more. We're going to start looking at automation, um, digital regulation, um, preventative care, inclusive growth. How do we basically, all this benefit we're creating, are we also filtering down that benefit to the community? Are we also taking the community with us? If we make an area really successful, does that mean small businesses can't afford to be there anymore? Does that mean local residents can't afford to be there anymore? So how do we make sure that we're all making, taking everyone through that journey with us? So to sum up, the bid model is a very flexible model. You can do the level one sort of thing, that's fine. Then you can do more interesting things, lobby, find more money, invest in, um, bring that investment to your area. But then you can do the bid 3.0 sort of thing, which we're testing at the moment. It's a bit more, how shall I put it, political, but we like being different. We like trying challenges. So I'm quite excited by it. But I think it's an exciting time for you all. I would say op be o have an open mind. Um, look into the bid model internationally. See what's out there, and I think you will be inspired. You will see what's going on from my colleagues in terms of what's going on internationally. And remember, this is a tool to empower you and your communities. I wouldn't see it as a competition or anything. There's, there's a lot of people that may have misunderstandings around it. Even in the UK, some local authorities still 
because they have the power whether BID can or can't happen, they think, okay, we don't need it because we're doing a great job. And that's okay as well. Build should only happen where people want it and where there's an opportunity. So with that in mind, I think you, you guys have, are gonna have an awesome time with this model, hopefully. And if you use it, there's so much opportunity out there for you. Thank you. So um, we've already gone through this a bit in the previous presentations, but I'll start with a little bit of bid history. So what is a bid? Uh, further to what was mentioned earlier, it's a business improvement district. Um, it has a bit of, uh, doesn't have the best brand recognition. I'm sure this might be the only room right now in this country that knows what a bid is. And furthermore, to complicate that even Worse, in Canada, bids are known as BIAs, which are business improvement areas. Um, generally speaking, bids are responsible for cleaning, safety, and marketing of specifically defined neighborhoods. And they began in many different types of ways, but again, further to the previous uh, presentations, they're usually begun by an active consortium of local business owners and stakeholders. In the UK, once bids are voted in, they're formalized as business-led business organizations that are funded through mandatory levies. And these mandatory levies are based on one to two percent of a business's rateable value. Rateable values are essentially the summary of what a business is worth, which is determined intermittently by the Valuation Office Agency and was last reviewed in 2017. Uh, in the UK, bids have been governed by legislation since 2004. Again, I know that we're, we're repeating things here, but bids were established 1970 in Canada and then made their way over to the US. And it's a common misconception. Usually when people hear about bids, oh, they started in the US. In the US, no, they started in Canada. Um, the original impetus for that first bid in Toronto was to combat growing competition from nearby malls. And then uh, bids emerging stateside in New Orleans in 1975. In the US, bid levies are imposed on the property owners and not the business owners. Um, I started my career in bid world in uh, a bid in New York City called the Lower East Side Partnership. And there I learned uh, the differences between New York City bids and bids in London. So in New York City, the bids, uh, the property owners are given the, the bid bills. But those property owners then usually pass those bid bills along to their commercial tenants. And this creates a bit of a disconnect because it's the property owners that have the seats on the boards and at the decision making table, but it's the business owners that are paying the bills. Also in New York City, the levies are collected uh, through a city agency called the New York City Department of Small Business Services. This lives underneath the mayor's office, and this is good in streamlining experiences amongst bids because all of the levies are collected through one central nucleus. Also in New York City, once bids are voted into law, that's it. They don't have to go back for renewal and they, you know, continue on. Over in London, uh, the business owners pay the levy and it's the business owners that have most of the seats on the board. The levies are collected by the local councils, which are different geographic based municipalities and different councils run very differently. Uh, Hassan is in Camden Council and my bid is split in between two different councils in Lambeth Council and Southwark Council. So we get two different experiences to complicate things even more. Also in London, bids must campaign for renewal every five years, which is great because it increases levels of accountability and transparency. So uh, when did bids arrive in London? Again, to reiterate, I know we keep on going over this, but uh, it was in the early 2000s 
that uh, bids first arrived in London. There were a bunch of different pilot schemes going on at the same time. And We Are Waterloo, which was called Circle Waterloo at the time, was part of a pilot scheme called, called the Circle Initiative, which ran pilots in five different central London neighborhoods. It was initially funded through 4.6 million pounds of single regeneration funding from the now defunct London Development Agency. And at the same time as the Circle Initiative, the Association for Town Center Managers was also running a similar pilot with five schemes in London. Uh, Waterloo was very unique in many ways for its application to be part of the Circle Initiative. It was the only applicant that was led by a community group um, called Waterloo Community Development Group, which still exists today, and residents. The other applicants to be part of the Circle Initiative were business-led and had more money backing them. The uh, intention of the community group in applying to be part of this bid pilot was to revive the business area that was located on the other side of Waterloo Station, which um, I'll share a bit more in a bit. And uh, it was also the only applicant that was presenting its match funding in the form of in-kind staff time, as opposed to actual pounds. And here is a chart um, that details the different uh, time frames that bids were enacted. Uh, the formal government legislation uh, finalized in 2004. 2005, Kingston first landed as the first bid. Later on in 2005, four out of the five pilots from the Circle Initiative went to ballot and had successful times. Waterloo was held back for a year. Um, thanks to different staff turnover that took place during that time. But in 2006, Waterloo went to ballot and had an extremely successful ballot. Here is a bid map that shows the original bid boundaries, which is the light orange, and then the darker orange was part of our expansion for the first renewal ballot. Um, but the initial bid vote, like I said, was very successful, and speculation suggests that su the success was owed to the community being starved by the mismanagement of Lambeth Council. So now that I've given a bit of background on how the bid came to be, let's talk about why Waterloo. Okay. What's the most noticeable thing about this photo? <laughs> the giant station right there, which we've now mentioned a couple of times. And so People typically, when you hear Waterloo, the first thing Londoners say is, oh, you mean the station? And I'm like, no, the neighborhood, because <laughs> it's just as much a neighborhood, too. So um, it's not surprising that people immediately associate Waterloo with the station. It's the busiest railway station in the UK. And if you count the connecting uh, transportation hubs in the surrounding area, it then becomes the busiest station complex in Europe. The station fully bisects the neighborhood which is evidenced by these larger buildings, and I'm sure you guys recognize the, co the originally London Eye, then Coca-Cola Eye over here. But this is the South Bank, and there's lots of commercial activity here. And then over there is good old Waterloo. <laughs> um, so it's historically being regarded as being on the wrong side of the tracks. And in the early 2000s, I was not there at the time, but I've been told that the neighborhood was very gruesome, with shop shutters covered in graffiti and homeless encampments, regular homeless encampments. Here's one of those homeless encampments. It was called Cardboard City, and this was the area outside of the station. That's another thing. When you say Waterloo to people, they're like, oh, Cardboard City? I'm like, no, lovely commerce. So. Um, this was a gigantic homeless encampment outside of the station with 200 people living there um, in the 80s and 90s. And in the late 90s, Lambeth Council uh, cleaned this up and m to make way for, they forced Cardboard City to vacate to make way for this behemoth which still stands today, the British Film Institute IMAX Theater, which was co completed in May 1999, immediately in the lead up to the bid pilot. So all of this is going on, and then bids hit the scene. So 
now that we've talked a little bit about the neighborhood, these are the major players of Waterloo. It features a lineup of the bids, uh, best and finest. Uh, the man in the middle is Chris Smith. He was the first bid chair of We Are Waterloo and was instrumental in getting the bid launched from pilot to legally enforceable bid. During the Circle Initiative, Chris was a savvy Waterloo resident and business owner. His interactions with the local council began to expose him to the inefficiencies of Lambeth Council and his love for the retail variety of Lower Marsh and investment in the livelihood of the community eventually propelled him into a place where he was soon chairing the bid. And now to put a face to a name, this is the commercial artery of our bid, that's Lower Marsh. <coughs> And there's a flyer from Chris's, Chris's shop, Greensmith's, which is still thriving today on Lower Marsh. Okay, so now that we've gone through a bit of bid history and background on Waterloo, let's talk about the pros and cons to starting a bid. So we can start with the good news, the pros. Bids have the purview to gain quick favor with quick wins, such as cleaning the graffiti off of those shutters or hanging flower baskets. This is like what Hassan was saying, bid 1.0. Um, bids are by nature more nimble and flexible than local councils. And in We Are Waterloo's case, Lambeth was a historically disorganized borough. Uh, business owners saw immediate value in the bid by helping navigate channels such as acquiring permits or receiving feedback on planning applications. Waterloo is also home to the Lower Marsh Market, which uh, was struggling immensely under management of, surprise, surprise, Lambeth Council. The bid was able to take on the Lower Marsh Market as a bid-based project and uh, like the creative uh, uh, pilot that Hassan was talking about, Lower Marsh Market now has its own staff and is a profit driving entity that uh, is a great resource for office workers in the area. That's a scene from the Lower Marsh Market on a regular afternoon. So speaking in more general terms, regardless of whether you're a resident, a tourist, or a visitor, it's hard to disagree with the desire to be in a place that is clean, safe, and green. Uh, these are the main tenets of running a bid. Bids by nature also have access to grants and channels of funding to support community initiatives. During, uh, during my time working in New York, I was at the LES partnership, I ran a public art project called 100 Gates Project that connect, connected artists with businesses to install original murals on the shop shutters. And over a five year period, this project was, over to rate, was able to raise half a million dollars in funding and spread to multi different New York City neighborhoods. So again, allowing projects to kind of grow their own legs, evolve, and make a real impact in communities is one of the very most valuable parts of working on a bid. When it comes to maintaining community, bids have a powerful voice and are able to lobby local government on behalf of a neighborhood's best interest. Bids become reflections of their surrounding communities and are designed to devise creative ways to bring these entities together. And businesses want to see value for their money. And again, back to bid 1.0, bids are able to engage in projects of economies of scale. And we work with the same recycling contractor, First Mile, and the, the, the bids who are paying the mandatory levy end up getting that basically refunded back to them on an annual basis by the economies of scale we're able to engage with our recycling scheme. And now for the bad news. <laughs> there will always be opponents to the bid. No matter where you are, no matter what your plan is, there's always going to be people that are challenging you. Uh, the bid levy, at the end of the day, it's just another tax. And why should business owners have to pay that? Especially with the death of the high street already being such a hotly debated topic, how can we justify that m more taxes on brick and mortar businesses? Devising cross-sector programs is not a perfect science. And if you're producing, for example, if you're producing a food and beverage event, then the retail sectors are going to be knocking down your doors, bound to feel, bound to feel alienated. From day one, it's essential that you listen to your community 
And that is helpfully written into the legislation that you have to have certain uh, thresholds of positive feedback. But if your neighborhood doesn't want to bid, <laughs> you may want to move on and find another neighborhood. Um, in the UK, while council budgets are shrinking, bids are being looked at to fill in the missing pieces. But people want to see tangibly where their bid levy dollars are going and not have it go on just covering the, to fill in those missing pieces from the council and covering those baseline uh, responsibilities such as cleaning and security. Also, bids rely heavily on partnerships. And when you're relying on local government, there's a chance that they can cut schemes at our programs without warning. For example, this is very recent to London. The Metropolitan Police formally offered uh, business improvement districts and local councils a security scheme where you could buy one police officer, get one free. And there had been rumors circulating that this might change, this might go away. And basically, over the past couple weeks, it was announced that the program would essentially no longer exist in its current form. And our financial years end at the end of March, so all of the bids had, who had been allocating enough money to get buy one, get one free police officer to enhance the security of their neighborhoods. And now we all have to scramble figuring out how we're going to explain this to our boards and our communities. There's also a potential for inequality amongst levy paying businesses that are paying at different scales. For instance, a hotel is probably going to demand more attention than a smaller shop on the high street. And if bids are too successful, a neighborhood can experience rapid change leading to rising rents and small independent businesses that were the ones creating the charm and the character of the neighborhood to begin with can get pushed out and point the finger at the bid. So um, now I'm going to leave you with four project concepts with corresponding examples of successful initiatives um, that can be applied in any neighborhood. Project concept number one is community-based events. <coughs> These are great ways to showcase the best of what your neighborhood has to offer by featuring your local businesses. We Are Waterloo is home to a diverse cross-section of businesses and so of, uh, of restaurants with different types of cuisine. So we run an annual food festival. And last year, the food festival coincided with Germany versus Belgium, with, sorry, England versus Belgium. And uh, naturally, the bids set up a screen, the streets were filled, and it was an amazing way to showcase the neighborhood. Uh, back in NYC, the Lower East Side was once, the Lower East Side where I worked at my previous bid was once home to neighborhoods full of pickle barrelers. The bid capitalizes on this eccentric bit of history by throwing an annual pickle day which includes pickle-themed dishes from LES restaurant tours, and of course, a giant pickle mascot. <laughs> Project concept number two is placemaking. Placemaking is a very broad term, and this room full of, you know, bid light professionals, I'm sure has heard this term many times, but essentially what it describes is animating a space and turning it into a place. A bid's connections will open it up to varying cross sectors. This will include both planning departments at the local authority and developers interested in making their mark in your bid neighborhood. Um, also includes a consortium of local neighborhood creatives. So this unlikely recipe can result in securing funding from developers uh, to commission construction hoarding murals that can be designed by local artists. And this is a great way for another quick win in your bid community. Project number three is corporate social responsibility. Waterloo's business makeup includes a large majority of office workers. And these types of people are interested in these types of opportunities. So the bid therefore runs a number of annual give back programs. Um, this year we had a Christmas gift drive that collected 2,000 gifts to give to uh, charities in the neighborhood. We also run a monthly food bank collection. And for each one of our events, we invite charity partners from the neighborhood to uh, be activate on site and request donations. This is Waterloo Action Center, 
and at our Christmas event, they were able to raise 600 pounds to support free legal advice for the community. And project number four, project concept number four is partnerships, which is essential, uh, an essential building block to most successful bids. Recently at We Are Waterloo, we teamed up with the Vaults Festival, which describes itself as London's answer to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It's a two month long arts and entertainment festival that drew in 80,000 people into the Waterloo neighborhood to enjoy one of 428 productions across 16 different venues. It took place over two months and perfect timing during January, February, and early March, which is the downtime for any retail sector. So by supporting this festival, Weir Waterloo was able to help drive traffic into surrounding food and beverage businesses and showcase the neighborhood as a destination worth returning to. To conclude, build work, bid work is rewarding and it's passionate people like us that are drawn to this emerging field. Thank you so much. Schönen guten Tag. Ich hoffe, jeder versteht mich. Ähm, vielen Dank dafür, dass ich eingeladen worden bin. Ich freue mich, hier sein zu können. Es ist etwas ganz Besonderes, hier in Barcelona sein zu können, uns über unsere kleine Stadt und unsere Projekte zu berichten. Ähm, ich bin Fritjof Büttner, bin die langweilige Verwaltung, die sehr schwerfällig ist und äh, werde jetzt trotzdem versuchen, ihn kurz und bündig zu erzählen, was wir in Hamburg mit dem BIT so gemacht haben. Ich bin Stadtplaner und gleichzeitig auch diplomiert in der Verwaltung, also eher wirklich das, der langsame Elefant. Ähm, seit 2006 bin ich nur für Business Improvement Districts zuständig. Vorher war ich für Zentren und Einzelhandel zuständig und in dieser Zuständigkeit haben sich die, hat sich die BIT-Gesetzgebung entwickelt und nach drei Jahren war ich dann nur noch für BITs da. Das ist das, was ich Ihnen kurz erzählen will, da kann ich drüber springen, das sehen wir sowieso gleich. Einmal, wo ich herkomme, Hamburg ist nach unserer Auffassung im Herzen Europas. Das wissen Sie wahrscheinlich, die meisten von uns kommt Nivea, Mont Blanc, Hapag Lloyd, Airbus und der HSV ist im Augenblick zweite Liga, das vergessen wir mal. Wir sind eine Hafenstadt, aber 100 Kilometer entfernt von der See, manche die uns in Hamburg besuchen, ich hoffe, einer, die einigen von Ihnen vielleicht auch, erwarten, dass wir einen Strand haben, wie hier in Barcelona. Das ist leider nicht der Fall. Man muss 100 Kilometer fahren, um ans Meer zu kommen. Wir sind im Herzen einer Region, die insgesamt 500 ganz kleine und mittelgroße Städte hat, insgesamt mit Hamburg zusammen 5 Millionen Einwohner. Wir haben als erster deutsches Bundesland 2005 ein Bitgesetz ähm, auf den Weg gebracht, beziehungsweise wir haben eigentlich zwei Jahre vorher angefangen, wir haben zwei Jahre gebraucht, ab 2005 galt es. Wir waren das erste Land in Deutschland und es war das erste Mal, das sagten uns unsere Juristen, dass es etwas für das deutsche Recht Untypische eingeführt worden ist, nämlich dass man für, äh, für andere Geld einzieht, damit die Maßnahmen umsetzen, die wirklich nah an den Maßnahmen sind, die die Stadt sowieso umsetzen muss. Das war das Besondere. Und dieses ganze Konstrukt äh, haben wir dann auch ähm, häufig ändern müssen. Ähm, ich erzähle gleich nochmal dazu, wir sind inzwischen bei der vierten Änderung. Inzwischen gibt es aber auch Bits in anderen Bundesländern, und zwar in neun Stück. 48 laufen dort insgesamt, 33 davon sind aktiv. Das kleinste hat acht Grundstücke, das größte hat 300 Grundstücke. Beide dieser extremen Beispiele sind in Bremen verortet. Das größte Budget hat ein Bit in Hamburg mit 10,3 Millionen Euro. Das kleinste in Schleswig-Holstein mit 3.500 Euro, da wurde nur die Weihnachtsbeleuchtung für einen kleinen Straßenzug bezahlt. Hier sehen Sie alle Bits in Hamburg. Wir haben derzeit 
12 Bits laufen, 26 haben wir insgesamt eingerichtet. Das liegt daran, dieser Unterschied der Zahlen, dass Bits immer wieder eingerichtet werden nach fünf Jahren. Insgesamt haben wir zusätzlich jetzt noch sieben in der Vorbereitung. Ich zeige Ihnen mal ein paar Gründe dazu, warum wir zur Bit-Gesetzgebung gekommen sind und warum Bits überhaupt in Hamburg entstehen. Das eine ist das Design der Innenstädte, der öffentliche Raum, der wird als nicht mehr aktuell empfunden, eher als hässlich, als langweilig. Da unten rechts sehen Sie zum Beispiel eher was, was vielleicht Panzer abhält. Vom Design her kann man erkennen, aus den 60er Jahren stammt. Also die, ups, ich will nicht zu mir. Das Design ist eine Kritik, die insbesondere immer gegenüber der Stadt hervorgebracht werden, worden ist. Und man hat gesagt, man kann in einem schlechten Umfeld, das nicht schön ist, auch nicht gut wirtschaften. Der zweite Punkt ist das, was man im weitesten Sinne SOS nennt, Sauberkeit, Ordnung, Pflege der öffentlichen Räume. Hier sehen Sie ein paar Beispiele. Es lohnt sich trotzdem, nach Hamburg zu kommen. Das ist Zufall gerade, sagen wir es mal so. Aber wir haben solche Situationen, wo man sich deutlich verbessern kann. Das dritte sind die Nutzungskonflikte. Wir haben immer mehr Lieferung, wir haben sehr viel Werbung im öffentlichen Raum. Also der öffentliche Raum muss alle möglichen Interessen aufnehmen und muss irgendwie zurechtzukommen. Und das Bild links unten zeigt im Grunde die gesamten Nutzungskonflikte, die wir haben. Werbung, Toilette, Gastronomie, alles innerhalb von zwei Metern. Dazu kommen noch Fahrradfahrer, Fußgänger, Autofahrer. Das ist manchmal zu viel für den öffentlichen Raum. Und da sich nicht alles äh, so, da es sich so entwickelt hat und nicht geplant war, haben wir sehr viele Konflikte. Insbesondere auch im verkehrlichen Bereich mit Lieferungen und Erreichbarkeit für Kunden, das heißt Parkplätze und ähnliches. Das sind die Gründe, warum man gesagt hat, hier muss die Stadt ran, aber die Stadt hat wiederum gesagt, wir erfüllen unsere Grund. Instandsetzung, wir erfüllen unser Level, was wir über die Steuern finanzieren können und wenn ihr mehr wollt, dann müsst ihr auch bereit sein, das selbst zu finanzieren und so sind wir zu diesem Bitgesetz gekommen. Unser Bitgesetz hat ein paar Paragraphen mehr als der Entwurf, den Sie hier haben, aber im Prinzip ist es dasselbe, es geht um die Ziele, es geht um die Maßnahmen, wie ein Bit entsteht, ähm, wer es führt, bei uns sind das Unternehmen, die solche Bits führen, wie der Antrag für ein Bit offiziell gestellt wird, wie das Geld eingesammelt wird und schließlich wie das Geld dann auch wieder ausgegeben wird durch die Bits und am Ende regeln wir, wie lange die Laufzeit ist. Ich werde dazu gleich noch mal im Einzelnen was sagen. Es ist ein relativ kleines Gesetz und es ist, dient in erster Linie der Gelderhebung. Das ist das Wichtigste. Also dass man Geld für das, man hat eine gesetzliche Grundlage, um Geld einzusammeln. Die Definition, die wir haben, entspricht auch der, die wir eben schon gehört haben. Bei uns ist es ganz wichtig, ein Bit kann nur von Privaten äh, initiiert werden, nicht von der Politik. Das hat die Politik hier und da mal versucht, das hat nicht geklappt bei uns. Es müssen schon Initiativen sein, die aus dem Quartier kommen. Sie müssen selbst organisiert sein. Wir von Seiten der Stadt beraten diese Projekte. Wir nennen das Good Governance oder Urban Governance, aber auf keinen Fall ist es eine Public-Private-Partnership. Viele Maßnahmen, die wir später umsetzen, können in Public-Private-Partnership sein. Aber ein BIT selbst ist bei uns eine Betreuung durch die öffentliche Verwaltung, eine Betreuung durch die Stadt, eine Hilfestellung, Beratung, wo wir nur können. Das ist ein kleiner Unterschied aus meiner Sicht zu Public-Private-Partnership. Wie auch in allen anderen Projekten, äh, Ländern, die wir hier heute gehört haben oder Beispielen, ist es so, dass die Stadt das Geld einsammelt. Wir sind quasi in Kasso für die Privaten. Zu diesem Chart könnte ich im Grunde eine Stunde reden. Äh, ich werde jetzt mich beschränken und nur auf die ganz wichtigen Punkte kommen. Sie sind ja in einer Phase, wo Sie überlegen, ist es politisch sinnvoll, so ein Instrument einzuführen? Ist es sinnvoll, daran teilzunehmen? Welche Erfolg, äh, Erfolgschancen hat es? Und in der Vorbereitungsphase, hatte ich ja eben schon gesagt, sind es die Privaten, 
die sich organisieren, die so ein Projekt vorbereiten, unterstützt von der Stadt. Aber die Schwierigkeit ist, und da bereite ich Sie jetzt schon mal drauf vor, manchmal dauert die Vorbereitung länger, als das Projekt am Ende läuft. Man muss sich kennenlernen, man muss zusammenfinden, man muss sich auf Maßnahmen einigen, man muss überlegen, wem man so ein Projekt anvertraut als Manager. Also es sind viele Entscheidungen zu treffen und es hilft keiner. Man hat auch kein Geld am Anfang. Man muss aber vielleicht einen Experten bezahlen. Man muss einen Juristen bezahlen, falls man Verträge mit der Stadt machen will oder falls man Verträge mit Experten machen will. Man braucht, wenn man den öffentlichen Raum umgestaltet, einen, der Verkehrsplanung beherrscht, der, der ein bisschen Ideen, Visionen erzeugt für die Stadtplanung. Man kann, ich habe Ihnen die Bilder gezeigt, man sieht einen langweiligen öffentlichen Raum und man möchte jetzt was Schönes machen. Jeder hat eine Vorstellung davon, aber die auf einen Nenner zu bringen, ist sehr schwierig. Das heißt, man braucht viel Geld, man braucht viel Geduld. Wenn wir von Seiten der Stadt, wir sind ja die Langweiligen, planen, dann sitzen wir da sechs Wochen und planen von morgens bis abends. Die BITs treffen sich ungefähr, also diese Initiativen treffen sich ungefähr alle zwei Wochen, einmal für zwei Stunden. Da kann man sich ja ausrechnen, wie lange es dauert, bis sie zum selben Ergebnis kommen wie eine professionelle Stadtplanung von Seiten der Stadt. Es dauert. Darauf muss man sich einstellen. Das ist, glaube ich, für Sie das Wichtigste, was man am Anfang braucht. Das Zweite ist, Sie brauchen immer jemand, der die Initiative übernimmt. Wir nennen das Leadership. Ohne dieses Leadership, ohne jemand, der, der Visionen vermitteln kann, der, der andere mitnehmen kann, der Kompromisse erzielen kann, der Lobbyarbeit bei, äh, sich für das eigene Projekt bei der Stadt machen kann. Wir wollen mehr Parkplätze, wir wollen weniger Parkplätze, wir wollen hier einen großen Park, wir wollen diese Fläche auch noch für unsere Umgestaltung haben. Ohne einen Menschen, der sowas machen kann, funktionieren die Projekte schlecht. Also das ist, das ist keine richtige Demokratie, die man da hat. Man braucht wirklich einen, der, der auf den Tisch haut und sagt, jetzt machen wir das so und ich kümmere mich darum, von euch brauche ich nur den Rückhalt. Bei der Entscheidung über ein Bit ist es bei uns ein sogenanntes Negativquorum, das heißt für die Beantragung, erstmal ein Positivquorum, Entschuldigung, für die Beantragung braucht man 25, 15% der Grundstücke und 15% der Grundstücksflächen. Wenn man die hinter sich hat, kann man einen Antrag bei der Stadt stellen. Der Antrag wird öffentlich ausgelegt, einen Monat lang, und jeder Eigentümer hat das Recht, diesem Antrag zu widersprechen. Widersprechen mehr als ein Drittel der Grundstücke oder ein Drittel der Fläche, scheitert die Initiative an dieser Stelle. Die Stadt richtet das BIT nicht formal ein. Das ist bei uns erst einmal passiert. Das heißt, wir haben daraus gelernt, die Projekte werden sehr gut vorbereitet. Wenn es dann angenommen worden ist, das heißt also weniger als ein Drittel widersprochen haben, richtet die Stadt das per Rechtsverordnung ein. Die Laufzeit wird beantragt, das kann bei uns ein Jahr sein, maximal aber fünf Jahre. Und in diesen fünf Jahren hat der Aufgabenträger, das ist der Bitmanager, einen festen Plan umzusetzen, der beantragt worden ist. Wir haben im Grunde in einem sehr privatwirtschaftlichen Umfeld eine Planwirtschaft. Und äh, es gibt zwar bestimmte Regularien, wie wir davon abweichen können, aber im Prinzip kriegt jeder Eigentümer das, worüber er am Anfang abgestimmt hat. Ich zeige Ihnen jetzt ein paar Beispiele. Was, äh, Sie haben ja eben gesehen, wie es trist aussehen kann. Hier sehen Sie ein paar Beispiele, wie der öffentliche Raum und Plätze schöner geworden sind. Hier haben wir Beleuchtung. Rechts ist Weihnachtsbeleuchtung, links ist eine Lampe. Im Unterschied zu Ihnen hier in Katalonien machen wir den, auch den öffentlichen Raum mit Bits schöner, wobei wir darauf achten müssen, was die Vorredner auch schon gesagt haben, dass wir immer über dem Level sind. Das sage ich aber gleich nochmal. Hier ist auch eine äh, Corporate Identity kreiert worden, links mit Bäumen, in der Mitte klassisch mit einem Schriftzug, rechts durch eine bestimmte Beleuchtung, die man im Winter hat. Hier haben wir für alle ganz wichtig Marketing. Ein Bit hat eine eigene App entwickelt, hat nicht so gut funktioniert, weil man sie in dem riesigen App Store einfach nicht findet. Wir nehmen Events wie Christopher Street Day, wir informieren über Maßnahmen, die in den Projekten stattfinden. Ähm, unten links sehen Sie auch ein kleines Logo, das man sich entwickelt hat mit diesen eckigen Bäumen. 
ähm, Opernboulevard. Man hat sogar versucht, eine Straße umzubenennen. Das hat die Politik am Ende dann verhindert. Es ist weiterhin die Dammtorstraße. Aber man versucht durch kleine Maßnahmen, durch Namen oder Ähnliches, eine neue Identität zu schaffen und den Standort vor allen Dingen zu vermarkten. Natürlich machen wir auch äh, BIT-1-Maßnahmen, obwohl wir bei, mit den ersten Projekten schon viel BIT-2 gemacht haben, weil wir nämlich den öffentlichen Raum umgestaltet haben. Hier sehen Sie unsere Servicekräfte, die in verschiedensten Bereichen tätig sind, mit ganz unterschiedlichen Serviceaufgaben. Und wir pflanzen an, wir pflegen grün, es werden Kinderspielplätze gebaut, man versucht sich dem Kunden zu nähern. Also, die Projekte sind häufig doch etwas näher an der Realität in ihren eigenen Quartieren, als es manchmal die Verwaltung ist. Das sage ich als jemand, der aus der Verwaltung kommt. Wir haben eigentlich einen hohen Anspruch, dass wir wissen, wie unsere Stadt funktioniert. Aber wir mussten auch lernen, in den Quartieren wusste man es ein bisschen besser. Hier so die Beispiele nochmal zusammengefasst, die Maßnahmen, die nach unserem Gesetz möglich sind. Sie brauchen sich das gar nicht im Einzelnen anzugucken. Das Wichtigste ist, wenn wir gefragt werden, was können wir machen, sagen wir erstmal alles. Überlegt erstmal, was ihr mit diesem BIT machen wollt und dann entscheiden wir, ob es geht oder nicht. Das Wichtige, und das sagten die Vorredner auch, ist, das, was die Stadt machen muss, muss sie auch weiterhin in einem BIT machen. Das, was ein BIT machen kann, ist immer das Zusätzliche. Bei uns hat das mal jemand das Cappuccino-Prinzip genannt. Unten ist der Kaffee, das ist die Stadt. Und die Sahne ist schließlich das Bit, die das extra oben drauf setzt. Und noch ein paar Beispiele, wie es schön sein kann. So sah es vorher aus. Das ist unser Musterprojekt. Dieses Projekt lief schon während der Gesetzgebung. Das war ganz wichtig, sodass die Politik sehen konnte, eine zusätzliche Steuer auf Zeit lohnt sich. Die Menschen wollen das vor Ort. So sieht es danach aus. Ich glaube, man sieht den Unterschied, nicht nur wegen Schwarz-Weiß. Nochmal schwarz-weiß, so sah es vorher aus. Hier hat die Stadt ein Baugrundstück zur Verfügung gestellt, damit daraus ein großer Platz wird. Da hat die Stadt auf sehr viel Geld verzichtet. Opernboulevard, so sah es vorher aus, sehr trist. Unsere große Oper, die eine unserer höchsten kulturellen Institutionen in Hamburg ist, hatte, eine wirklich, hatte ein wirklich schreckliches Umfeld, war eigentlich nur eine Straße, ist jetzt deutlich schöner geworden, man hat viel mehr Platz zum Flanieren, es gibt äh, Restaurants, die draußen Stühle und Tische aufstellen können, es ist wunderschön geworden. Hier der T-Bark vorher mit einer Designmode rechts aus den 70er Jahren, auch da ist es schöner geworden, aus dem Brunnen ist ein Beet geworden, man hat Stühle hingestellt, das hat man aus New York gelernt, da kann sich jeder hinsetzen, es besteht kein Konsumzwang. Alte Holzenstraße, ein kleines Management, Bit, äh, Bit 01, wie gesagt, wo man nur ein bisschen Weihnachtsbeleuchtung macht und ist verschönert, sauer und ein bisschen organisiert. Hier, das ist ein besonderer Fall, das ist eine Straße, wo sehr viele ältere Menschen leben und wir hatten 13 solcher Unfälle, wo man Gas mit Bremse verwechselt hatte und es wurde immer in Geschäfte gefahren. Es war mordsgefährlich, es ist Gott sei Dank nie was passiert. Inzwischen hat das BIT für Sicherheit gesorgt, jetzt gibt es dort sehr tief verankerte Bänke und ähm, ja, wir nennen das kleine Sitzgelegenheiten und eine Mutter kann mit dem Kind wieder gefahrlos dort einkaufen gehen, was vorher immer ein gewisses Risiko hatte. Es waren die Menschen über 75. So. Hier jetzt äh, unsere Innenstadt, das ist äh, unsere ja, Downtown Area, äh, wo der Haupteinzelhandel stattfindet. Er ist fast geschlossen, Bitgebiet inzwischen, es gibt nur wenige Ausnahmen und wir rechnen damit, dass die eine oder andere von diesen wenigen Ausnahmen auch noch ein Bit wird. Insgesamt haben die Bits in der Innenstadt über einem, äh, 51 Millionen Euro investiert, überwiegend fast die Hälfte, nee, in der Innenstadt ist es sogar überwiegend in Maßnahmen, die zur Veränderung des öffentlichen Raums dienen. Also man hat die Gehwege neu gemacht, man hat eine neue Beleuchtung vorgenommen, man hat äh, Parkplätze weggenommen, man hat einfach äh, verschönert, wo am Anfang der Diskussion, 
als ich mit den Eigentümern sprach, die das ja letztendlich bezahlen, äh, es immer noch hieß, das ist eigentlich staatliche Aufgabe, warum müssen wir das machen? Hat sich sehr schnell gezeigt, dass sie einen ganz anderen Standard als die Stadt äh, bereitstellen und dass sie dann auch bereit sind, diese Umgestaltung vorzunehmen. Das war eine Überraschung, das wussten wir nicht, als wir das Gesetz gemacht haben. Damit sind wir davon ausgegangen, dass unser eines Musterprojekt, der Neue Wahl, das einzige sein wird, wo umgebaut wird. Inzwischen ist das die Regel. Hier sehen wir das Gesamtinvest, das in Hamburg durch BITS äh, vorgenommen worden ist. Das liegt bei 65 Millionen Euro, erbracht durch private Eigentümer, muss man immer wieder sagen. Das verteilt sich auf unterschiedliche Maßnahmen, 4,8 Millionen für ähm, den, die Aufwertung des öffentlichen Raums, 2,7 für Pflanzung, Neupflanzung, für Marketing 5 Millionen, für Sauberkeit über 4 Millionen, 6,5 Millionen ist Weihnachtsbeleuchtung, sehr teuer bei uns. Ähm, ich bin manchmal ein Weihnachtsmuffel, ich wäre ganz froh, wenn es hier und da mal keine gäbe und ich ohne Merry Christmas einkaufen könnte zu Weihnachten, ist ohnehin anstrengend genug, aber jedes Projekt möchte gerne Weihnachtsbeleuchtung haben. Und ich habe hier in Barcelona auch mal gesehen, Sie haben auch sehr schöne und sehr unterschiedliche. Bei uns führt das dazu, das gilt auch für die Gestaltung des öffentlichen Raums, da die Quartiere alle selbst was machen, dass es unterschiedlich ist. Manche Städte, ich habe mir zum Beispiel mal Maastricht angeguckt, die haben eine Weihnachtsbeleuchtung, die geht durch die komplette Stadt. Aber es wird dann auch von der Stadt bezahlt. Das können wir uns nicht leisten in Hamburg. Ich bin insbesondere in Japan gefragt worden, die auch im letzten Jahr ein Bitgesetz eingeführt haben, warum wollen denn Eigentümer überhaupt solche Bits machen. Und das Wichtigste ist, es ist privates Business. Es entstehen sehr professionelle Netzwerke, untereinander, deswegen auch diese langen Vorbereitungsphasen von mehreren Jahren. Man lernt sich kennen, man schätzt das Know-how, das andere in dem Vorbereitungskreis mithaben und diese Netzwerke funktionieren auch ohne Witz. Es gibt, das wurde hier auch schon gesagt, keine Trittbrettfahrer, keine Freerider, jeder muss bezahlen. Und die Art und Weise der Bezahlung ist ein Bemessungsmaßstab, der für relativ viel Sicher äh, Gerechtigkeit sorgt. Auch das ist ein Thema. Bei den freiwilligen Organisationen zahlen die Großen manchmal genauso viel wie die Kleinen, aber profitieren viel mehr davon. Deswegen haben wir hier einen Bemessungsmaßstab, der sich bei uns nach der Fläche und nach der Geschossigkeit richtet. Vorher war er an die Grundsteuer angeknüpft, jetzt ist er an die Fläche und die Geschossigkeit. Das erinnert sehr an den Entwurf aus Katalonien. Für die Eigentümer ist es sehr praktisch, dass sie die Bitabgabe auf ihre Mieter umlegen können, sofern sie gut gemachte Verträge haben. Das heißt, die, die unmittelbar von den Bits profitieren, nämlich die Händler und teilweise auch die Büros, die bezahlen einen Großteil der Bitgebühr. Der Eigentümer profitiert von den Bits auf etwas längere Sicht, weil sein Eigentumswert oder der Wert der Immobilie steigt. Es hat sich gezeigt, dass Bits dafür zu führen, dass Flächen in Bits deutlich einfacher zu vermarkten sind. Also die, die Einzelhandelsflächen, wenn sie frei stehen, gehen schneller an den Markt. Die Büroflächen gehen schneller an den Markt. Manchmal werden wir schon angerufen und gefragt, wird da ein Bit kommen? Wir wollen in dieses Quartier ziehen mit unserem Büro, mit, wir wollen 10.000 Quadratmeter Fläche anmieten, wir wollen dahin ziehen, kommt da ein Bit oder kommt keins. Oder man hat ihnen schon ganz früh in einer Bit-Initiative Bilder gezeigt, wie es mal aussehen könnte und nun werden wir von Seiten der Stadt gefragt, kommt dieses Bit auch wirklich? Wenn das kommt, ziehen wir dahin, sonst nicht. Also es zeigt sich, dass es in der Vermarktung sehr erfolgreich ist. Und das Letzte, das ist ganz wichtig, Bits schaffen ein Klima, zur Investition in die Immobilien, im Umfeld und in dem Bit selbst. Und diese Investitionen sind zum Teil erheblich höher als die Investition, die über ein Bit geschaffen ist. Bei dem Bit Opern Boulevard, am Anfang, von dem ich berichtet habe, waren die Bitkosten bei 2,5 Millionen. 2,5 Millionen hat die Stadt nochmal draufgelegt, also 5 Millionen. Und eine halbe Milliarde Euro ist zur selben Zeit in die Gebäude geflossen. Zum Teil, weil es das Bit gibt, 
Zum Teil ähm, wollte man mit dem BIT die hohen Investitionen absichern, die man in die Gebäude getätigt hat. Das zeigt, wie wichtig diese Interaktion zwischen Immobilienwirtschaft ist und Marketing vor Ort. Was man damit für Potenziale hat, um äh, für Quartiere und für die Stadt etwas zu tun. Das zeigt diese Folie nochmal sehr deutlich. Es kommt also deutlich mehr herein, als von den, Invest äh, von den Eigentümern investiert worden ist. Auch das habe ich eben, eben schon gesagt. Sie kriegen die Folien ja sowieso, dann können Sie nochmal gucken. Wir hatten eigentlich von allen Seiten überraschenderweise positives Feedback. Alle unsere Gesetzesänderungen, die wir machten, durften wir im Wahlkampf machen, was normalerweise nicht üblich ist, weil alle Parteien, bis auf eine kleine Splitterpartei, dafür waren. Das ist sehr unüblich. Normalerweise wird sowas in der Parteipolitik sehr umstritten sein. Wir hatten das Glück, alle unsere Parteien haben uns unterstützt, obwohl es sich um eine zusätzliche Steuer handelt. Das muss man immer wieder sagen. Also es werden Menschen belastet. Die Besucher haben bei den umgestalteten Gebieten festgestellt, war das nicht schon immer so schön hier? Äh, haben das zum Teil gar nicht wahrgenommen. Und insofern die einzigen Probleme, die wir hatten, das war auch der neue Wahl, da waren die Spalten zwischen den Steinen zu groß und die Absätze der Damen brachen ab und man hatte Probleme und wir waren das erste Mal mit einem Bit auf Seite 1 von unserer Yellow Press, nämlich die Schuhe, äh, Schuhe gehen kaputt bei den Kunden, die teuer einkaufen wollen. Und damit bedanke ich mich bei Ihnen und freue mich auf eine Diskussion. Vielen Dank. Ara es al vostre torn de, de fer preguntes aprofitant la presència de la directora general i, de, i dels ponents d'aquesta taula rodona. Així que si algú té alguna pregunta per algú que s'adreci directament a algú dels ponents. Hola, bon dia. Jo tenia dues preguntes, una per la directora de Comerç. Quan explicava la implantació, com serà la possible implantació de, dels apeus, comentava que només eren les activitats econòmiques a peu de carrer. Què passa amb aquelles activitats que no estan a peu de carrer i que estan en un pis, en alguna planta superior? I després... I la segona pregunta era pel senyor Ho. Eh, abans d'implantar el BID a Candem Town, Voldria saber si abans hi havia un eix comercial, una associació i com va ser aquest període de transacció, de... Bueno, com ho van fer. Gràcies. Val. La, la resposta... Sí, de fet, el, el text de l'avantprojecte el que diu és que són les activitats que tenen, tenen accés des de planta de carrer, qualsevol activitat. Estic cap a... Si hi ha una planta primera que s'accedeix des del carrer, sí, des de la porteria, no. Això és el que diu l'avantprojecte de llei. Uh, so, in terms of um, what was there before the BID, there was a town center management team, well, one person and a half, and um, facilitated and paid for by the city, and then there was also a um, commerce um, a voluntary organization where businesses paid a contribution and um, were trying to make a difference in the area. The businesses felt as though a lot of the other businesses were benefiting, um, but also at the same time, the government or the local authority didn't have enough resource to make the vision they wanted to execute come alive. Um, they had a, loads of goals, they had a very big vision, but very limited resource. And when the bid model came, they thought, okay, this is a different vehicle, a different tool for us, try to make our vision come to life. And this time, hopefully, invite everyone to be part of this, as long as it's a majority. So there was a commerce sort of, um, business organization voluntary and there was a town center management team that team then worked with the um, center to basically turn into a bid and then they ran the bid Mis preguntas? 
Hola, bon dia. Hola. Bon dia. Se sent? Sí, dues preguntes. Una per la senyora directora general i altra pels tres convidats. Per la directora general, si... quin tipus de transició heu previst o preveu la llei en cas de canvi de, bueno, de, associa... de, la, de, de les associacions eh, doncs els apeus? I pels convidats, eh, han parlat de tres casos exitosos, de grans ciutats, Molts de nosaltres pertanyem a ciutats de tamany mitjà, a vegades petit. En el meu cas, doncs, Villanova i la Geltrú, som una ciutat de 65.000 habitants, eh, bueno, molt a prop de Barcelona. Quines diferències penseu que hem de tenir en compte de cara a impulsar els apeus? Val. Um, com, de, com deia, les associacions tenen la potestat, si fa més de cinc anys que actuen, de, de demanar, eh, d'impulsar un projecte de BIT. Eh, en el moment que això tira endavant, es constitueix una entitat gestora, per tant, l'associació pot formar part de l'entitat gestora, pot gestionar aquest BIT, si així ho considera, i de fet la transició, la, la llei no marca exactament quina és la transició, simplement el que diu és que l'associació pot demanar i pot formar part o pot ser la que impulsi l'entitat gestora de, de la PEU. No sé si responga la pregunta. Si parlem de mesures de suport a tota aquesta transició, evidentment des, de, des del govern, es, en el moment que això es tiri endavant, hi haurà línies d'acompanyament de, de, en tot aquest procés cap a aquelles sol·licituds que hi hagin de cara als apeus. Sí. Um, glaube nicht, dass es einen Unterschied macht, ob uh, ein, ein Quartier groß oder klein ist. Das Wichtige an diesem Prinzip ist, uh, dass man gemeinsam es vorbereitet und gemeinsam durchführt. Natürlich werden Sie, wenn man die Beispiele aus London gesehen hat, nicht eine Million Euro pro Jahr in einer kleinen Stadt durch ein Bit sammeln können. Aber vielleicht reichen für die Ideen, die Sie haben, zur Verbesserung der Situation auch 100.000 oder 50.000. Das Wichtige ist, dass man gemeinsam vorbereitet gemeinsam Lösungen für die Probleme, die man vorfindet, entwickelt und dann mit Hilfe der Stadt diese Projekte einrichtet und dann die finanzielle Sicherheit hat und die Sicherheit hat, dass jemand sich um die Probleme dann auch professionell kümmert. Das steckt ja eigentlich hinter der BIT-Idee, dass man das, was wir aus Shoppingcentern schon seit langem kennt, jetzt auch für gewachsene Standorte macht. Ich hatte ein Beispiel aus einer kleinen Stadt in Schleswig-Holstein in Deutschland, ganz im Norden, die haben nur 3.500 Euro für eine Maßnahme, nämlich Weihnachtsbeleuchtung, zusammengesammelt und investiert. Aber ohne dieses Instrument BIT hätten sie nicht mal diese 3.500 Euro bekommen. Also man muss einfach nur gucken, dass egal, ob man ein großes oder kleines Projekt hat, die Mechanismen und die Prinzipien sind dieselben, nur die Budgets ändern sich und auch die Probleme sind leicht unterschied. Aber die Mechanismen, diese Bit-Idee sind immer dieselben. Gemeinsam und äh, auf Basis ähm, von Geldern, die die Stadt einsammelt und die dann wieder zu 100% ins Gebiet fließen. Das ist das Entscheidende. So, um, in, in response to that question, I think everything is relative. There's always bigger fish. Everyone feels poor. Everyone feels as though they're poorer than everyone else. Everyone feels as though they have a smaller budget. Camden Town back then had one of the smallest budgets in London. We always felt like the small fish in a big pond, basically. And then when you look internationally, we might, back then we had three, 400,000, but a um, New Western company only 20, 30 minutes away had four, five million. This is 10 times, 12 times the budget. Then when you look in America, um, bids have 10, 20 million. So who is the poorer? It's all relative. So budget isn't a limitation. Again, I think imagination is the real limitation. Um, with that vehicle, you now have a fixed amount of money. 
you, 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 you can start up. When most businesses start up, and I look at the private sector as a prime example, they start up with very little money, they bootstrap. The businesses that we support, the startup businesses, we follow their culture. We say, okay, if we have a budget, how can we make it successful with even less money? Because that's when you start thinking outside the box. That's when you think, okay, who do I need to become partners with? Who can give us their time and resource? Who can give us the money? Because if you have a good idea, you can find investment, you can crowdfund, you can get the government to invest for you. But the main thing is, finding ideas that are working maybe somewhere else or working here. You can pilot it, but you can say, okay, government, we don't have the money. We need you to give us some more contribution, some more funds. Or if it's a good investment in the area, you can go to bigger private sectors and say, why don't you come here and invest your money here? That's what we do in Camden Town. So we always bring in investment. We've, we've won national awards and international awards and we've basically beaten organizations like Coca-Cola, BP Shell. I think there was an, um, we, our ambition has always been higher. Um, we might be a small BID and um, have a limited resource, but we've beaten international companies on certain projects. Um, we were at an event, 4,000 4, people roughly, Royal Albert Hall, the royal family was there. We beat all these other companies. Um, I mean, international companies with massive budgets. And then they announced, Camden Town Unlimited. And then we go on the stage and we're like, and then it's like people as far as you can see, the Royal Albert Hall and like, but without the vision and with our budget, whatever size it is, you have to have the ambition, the energy, you have to make things happen. It's only a tool end of the day, the BID. It will only be as successful as you try to make it. I'm not saying you will always succeed, but you have to have the sort of energy, the sort of ideas. And you can find those ideas anywhere. Again, Samsung, for example, started off as fishmongers. Now they sell mobile phones. How do you go from selling fish to mobile phones? They sell tanks as well, by the way, if you didn't know, and rockets. But again, a bid, our bid started off with street cleaning, public realm, now we are buying buildings, we are providing free space, we are doing social work. How did the bid start from where it is and where it is now is up to you and where your journey takes you. Each journey is going to be different, each bid will have its own unique problems and have its own solutions, but again, it's only a vehicle. So remember that, the vehicle is up to you how you use it. I would say, don't look at limitations. If you think limitations, you'll already be thinking about how you're going to lose. We at Camden Town focus on how can we succeed, how we can make our vision come alive. So that's what I will try to say. Everyone here is here for your communities. You're here to help your communities and you are trying to basically be the leaders in those communities to make a difference. So what we find is we need to lead and you need to lead yourselves as well. And the bid model may be a vehicle, a, a tool for you to make that difference. And it might not be the tool for you to make that difference, but it's for you to decide. Oh, no sé qui havia aixecat la mà abans. N'hi ha tres. Doncs, dos, dues, llavors. N'hi ha tres, n'hi ha tres. Moltes gràcies. Doncs tres, les tres que havien... Agrair-los avui dia aquesta sessió i agrair-los a les persones que han participat perquè ens donen una injecció de moral. Des de Sant Antoni Comerç, que som un eix de la ciutat que portem més de 25 anys d'associacionisme, voldríem treballar també el tema dels bits perquè és un pas nou amb una política nova d'una associació que està treballant com fa 25 anys, adaptant-nos, però ho fem per voluntarisme i ho hem de fer a peu perquè sigui una cosa contractual i la gent es vegi obligada a fer-la. Però nosaltres tenim, primer volia preguntar al conjunt el que ha fet la nostra companya, abans de fer un bit, tots eren associacions on hi havia que no eren res, era comerç individual i no estava sota cap paraigües, o si, com s'ha dit, doncs amb alguns ja ho eren. L'altra pregunta també que volia fer la directora general és quan parla de bits turístics, què refereix amb la paraula turístic? Tindran un tractament especial a la resta de bits? Tindran diferència d'horaris? Què vol dir el tema aquest? I després també com es contempla el tema dels mercats municipals? Els mercats municipals serà un sol operador o seran tants operadors com concessionaris hi ha en el mercat. 
i com es farà la distribució. I després, quan un eix, més que un eix, un entorn comercial... I aquí acabo, eh? Això són moltes preguntes en una, eh? És que passa que com no he tingut oportunitat de fer aportacions, i avui que ens ho brinda, doncs per això. I l'última cosa és, vull dir, amb una zona comercial, amb una zona comercial, no un eix, sinó una zona comercial, si tu veus que tens una implantació del 50% en una àrea determinada i fas aquest a peu en aquesta àrea determinada, el resta de zona de l'eix del barri, com queda? Llavors tens que treballar amb una doble gerència, la gerència de la peu i la gerència de l'altra zona, o amb la mateixa gerència ho podem fer tot. Gràcies. Començo? Sí, és que els mitjans turístics, sí. Gràcies. Jo crec... Jo crec que... Em sembla que no he parlat de mitjans turístics. No, no he dit res de mitjans turístics. No, no, jo no ho he parlat, però bueno... No es contempla... No es contempla un mitjans turístic com a tal i no... Per tant, en aquest, en aquí no. Després, si vols, seguim parlant d'això, eh, per això. Respecte a l'associació que sol·licita ser una peu, delimita una àrea. I, per tant, és l'àrea la que entra a la peu. O sigui, aquesta àrea, l'exemple de Camden Town, doncs Camden Town agafa una àrea i més endavant hi ha una altra àrea que vol entrar en el bit de Camden, no? Bé, doncs això, tu gestiones el bit o la peu que tu has delimitat com a àrea. Punt. I ja està. I l'altra pregunta no me'n recordo. Ah, mercat, sí. El mercat és un espai col·lectiu i per tant compta com a un. Un. Volia contestar la pregunta de les associacions que existien prèviament. Also die Verbände waren bei uns natürlich auch sehr interessiert daran, welche Funktionen die BITS übernehmen würden. Die Verbände gibt es nach wie vor alle, die, da hat sich nichts geändert. Äh, sie sind äh, Teil der Vorbereitung eines BITS, sie beraten die BITS, äh, das Know-how der Verbände wird aufgenommen. Äh, bei dem Einzelhandelsverband äh, und dem City Management, der auch, es gibt ein City Management von, für die ganze Stadt, Das wird von den Verbänden bezahlt und die Verbände unterstützen diese Projekte und das City Management ist häufig in den Sitzungen der BITS mit vertreten und kann das eigene Know-how mit einbringen. Die Verbände haben bei uns immer wieder darauf hingewiesen, dass man nicht zu viel äh, Verantwortung an Private übergeben müsste, sondern sie haben immer darauf geachtet, dass die Stadt sich nicht aus ihrer Verantwortung entzieht, Wir sind der Meinung, das haben wir nie getan und deswegen haben wir auch keine größeren Konflikte mit den Verbänden gehabt. Wir haben sehr unterschiedliche Verbände vom Tourismus über Einzelhandel und Marketing und wir arbeiten gut mit denen zusammen. In terms of getting a, a bid started, it always usually begins in a grassroots level. And in the Lower East Side, at the Lower East Side Partnership, which was formerly the Lower East Side Bid, it was started by a merchants association, which then it emerged and evolved into a, bit, into a business improvement district. In Waterloo, like I mentioned in the presentation, it was a community group. And so it's, it's, it's always kind of a, a, a different a, a different consortium, but it's usually passionate people that are involved on a very grassroots community level coming together with the same ideals in mind. No sé si hi ha temps per alguna pregunta més. Hi havia una pregunta més? No sé si... Però breu, concisa, si pot ser. Una pregunta. Després hi ha un break i podem parlar aquí i el que faci falta. Diguem, previsiblement, en la ruta cap als bits, als apeus, les associacions de comerciants i els professionals que les gestionen tindran un paper capdal en la creació dels bits. També s'ha dit que s'haurien de gestionar per gerents. Llavors, la meva pregunta és què és un gerent? quin perfil ha de complir, quines capacitacions i què passarà amb els professionals que actualment gestionen 
les entitats, si són diferents les capacitats, si se'ls capacitarà, si hi ha un programa de formació previst i, diguem, com es gestionarà tot aquest tema. Well, the interesting thing about bids is it's a new industry. So the, the job description is going to be a reflection of the neighborhood. There will be certain things duplicated, but I'm sure my description is pretty different than the two of yours. And also because it's an, an emerging field, I wouldn't say that there is an immediate sense of competition in terms of a retail association manager because it's it's evolving, it's changing, and the type of skills that a retail manager has can merge with the type of skills that a bid manager would, would need to have also. So I don't see it as competition. I see it as something that is uh, organic, growing, and evolving. Uh, from my experience, I had no skills or expertise in retail, in commerce, in anything, basically. I just came out unemployed, joined, just learn and learn and learn. And I think the same can apply. If you already have skills, experience, qualification, you can on only build on that, I think. So if someone like me, most of our team um, in Camden Town have no experience, we don't have the qualifications, we don't have the experience, um, we just discovered B BIDs and we basically applied what we knew and we thought, okay, how do you think outside the box? Because when it comes to innovation or thinking outside the box, you don't really rely on what you already know. You focus on examples internationally, you focus on how to adapt for the future which is coming. So I would say, it's again, not competition, it's just evolving. So whether you're evolving as someone who is already in the industry, whether you're a retail manager or whatever it might be, or you're coming from a different industry because you then bring a different perspective, a different set of ideas, a different way of thinking, basically. And whenever you don't have the skills or the qualification, for Camden Town, for example, we have a very small team. Our BID team is only six people, five organizations, multi-million pound organizations, only six or seven people, but we buy the expertise. If we want the best, then we pay for the best. If we want the best thinking or the innovation, we pay for it. And that's what most companies do. They have very small teams, but if you want the best, the best always changes. The freshest things always change. So you keep the team the same, flexible, but people you work with, the partnerships you have always changes. Fle is, there's that flexibility. So you're more like a project manager almost. You're never really doing the projects necessarily, but you're making sure they're on budget, they're on time, and they're doing the things you need it to do. Um, in, bei uns ist es unterschiedlich. Wir haben verschiedenste Professionen, die Bits managen. Ich glaube, für Sie ist es ganz entscheidend, wie, wie dieses Management organisiert ist. In Hamburg sind es überwiegend Unternehmen, die, die den Auftrag kriegen, das Bit zu managen. In Amerika ist es eine Non-Profit-Organisation, die Manager einstellt. Und wie, in, wie wir das in New York mal erfahren haben und wie es auch in Hamburg ist, ist, es gibt gute und es gibt schlechte Manager. Wenn man einen schlechten Manager hat, der zu einem Unternehmen gehört, ist es bei einer Laufzeit von maximal fünf Jahren sehr schwierig, diesen schlechten Manager wieder rauszuschmeißen. Denn man muss die volle Laufzeit mit dem schlechten Management leben. Wenn man eine Non-Profit-Organisation hat, die einen Manager einstellt, und man stellt nach einem Jahr fest oder nach zwei Jahren, der macht keine gute Arbeit, kann man ihn einfach herausschmeißen und sich einen neuen besorgen. Das ist das Modell, was ich so nach 15 Jahren BIT-Erfahrung äh, vorziehen würde. Ähm, die Manager natürlich nicht, die würden es gerne andersrum sehen. Aber ich glaube, das ist eine sehr entscheidende Frage, die Sie sich in Ihren Projekten, wenn Sie das Gesetz haben und das Gesetz das möglich machen würde, sich stellen müssen. Also ich würde immer empfehlen, eine Non-Profit-Organisation hat die Verantwortung mit einem Vorstand aus dem Quartieren, vielleicht mit Experten noch besetzt und dann sich einen professionellen Manager suchen, der vielleicht nur einen Jahresvertrag oder zwei Jahresverträge hat. Ich glaube, er braucht ein bisschen länger, sonst kriegt man keine guten Leute. Und dann ganz genau aufpassen, ob die wirklich die Leistungen liefern, die sie erwarten und die Vision hat, die sie erwarten und nicht nur einfach was abarbeiten. Doncs, 
Desgraciadament, la jornada ha de continuar perquè jo crec que podríem continuar molt més aprofitant l'experiència, però com me l'ha ben dit la directora, ara hi ha un coffee break, així que si algú vol continuar preguntant, tindrà oportunitats. Moltes gràcies a tothom, moltes gràcies als tres jocs de la taula i a la directora.